I want to thank you for joining us on this legacy project. You know, to be honest, it's just so good to be able to study the scriptures together, to take some time, be relaxed and follow through all this wonderful material that we're sharing, laying out. And, uh, you know, the depth of the word of God is so valuable and so important that we take time to study, take time to learn, take time to grow. And so thanks for joining us on this legacy project. I want you to get your Bible, get your notebook, get ready. You can hit pause any time and look up the scriptures, check it out. And so let's click that button and get underway. Welcome to the Legacy Project. You know, these messages that we're putting down are just so important for people. We often talk about people growing into unity, maturity and wholeness. And even though, of course, coming together on a Sunday is so important, but often we don't get the real depth of God's Word. And to grow into Christ-likeness, we need the depth of God's Word. We need to study God's Word. The Bible says, study to show yourselves approved as a workmanship of God. And so it's so important to study God's Word and look at the depth of God's Word. And as we look at these subjects in this legacy project, I know that it will build your faith. I know it will encourage you in your walk with Christ. And so today, we're going to be looking at the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. You might say, wow, we're going to be looking at the whole Bible going from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to see what one began and what one finished. We're going to look at the contrast between the book of Revelation and the book of Genesis. Unbelievable. And so the book of Genesis basically means the beginning. It's like the origin. And the first book, we know it is the first book of the Bible. It's the first book of a larger book. The 66 books in the Bible. And also it's the first book of five books. The Torah, the law of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The Hebrews have the Old Testament. And of course, we as New Testament believers have the whole Bible, 66 books. But the book of Genesis means the beginning, the origin. And it's the first book of a larger book. The Revelation, the book of Revelation, of course, is the last book. Most people would be aware of that. It's the last book of the book of books. The last book of 66 books. 66 books and yet one book. I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the holy book. And of course, the Bible is written by holy man inspired by a holy God. And so the book of Revelation means the revelation of Jesus Christ. Another word for it is the apocalypse. And so the apocalypse, I want to read what that is to you today. It's the eschatological belief that the power of Satan is overcome and his evil rule end only by the direct intervention of God, who is the power of good and God will therefore create an entirely new, perfect, eternal age under His control for the everlasting enjoyment of all His righteous followers. You know, when you think about Hollywood, just about every movie is based on that statement right there, the apocalypse, the fight between good and evil. Of course, to be honest, God is not threatened on the throne. You know, how can God, the creator of all things, be threatened by a created being like Satan? But Satan is evil and he has got some dominion on this earth, even though Jesus Christ won dominion over Satan. The devil is still alive on planet earth. We see it through rapes and murder and slavery and child abuse today. But Jesus has overcome him. And if we give our lives to Christ, we too can overcome him. And so we see this book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. We need to study it today. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning... God. And you know, that tells everything there. Often, you know, when men put up a spaceship, they say, we're going to discover how we got here. We're going to discover the origin of the universe. Well, Genesis 1, in these simple few words, tell us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that word God is Elohim. It means self-existent one, the eternal creator. It's a plural word as well, because there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But God is sovereign. He is Lord over all. And you know, He's through all and to all and in all. And the important thing to make note is nothing is impossible with God. Even the simple bumblebee proves that. Scientists would tell us, how can it fly? It's impossible for its weight to get off the ground with the size of its wings. But God makes all things possible. Let me just read as we begin looking at this today. Psalm 33 verse 6. For the word of the Lord is right, 
and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap, and he lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, verse 9 tells us, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood first. You know, he spoke the world into being. Amazing thing, of course, Jesus was the word who became flesh. A book of John tells us that. But verse 10 says, The Lord brings the counsel of nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. Every person, every person is an individual. He considers all their works. That is an amazing chapter in Psalm 33. But let's go to the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 and verse 1, because we're looking at the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, verse 2 says, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now I want you to note that the sun and moon were not created till the fourth day. And uh, so here was God. He had a, an aspect of a day that maybe is not our day. The Bible says that a day unto the Lord is as a thousand years. Psalm 90 tells us that and Second Peter tells us that also. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now I want you to note that it was dark and without form. I don't believe God created anything dark and empty and without form. God creates it good. And so between verse 1 and verse 2, and we've got to remember that the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, never had verses. It never had uh, full stops. It never had commas. It was just a flow. And uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that we see where God began to create. And that word there, when he spoke the world into being, is like a recreation. And so the thought is possibly between our verse 1 and 2, there's this huge gap and the fall of, of Satan where he was cast to earth happened. It's interesting, of course, the Bible says that the earth was covered in water. The devil hates water. The Bible, Jesus said when the devil's cast out, he walks in waterless places. Interesting enough as well, we get water baptized and we get raised up a new man in Christ. And so the devil doesn't like water. And so maybe when the devil fell with his angels, God cast him to earth and bound him in ice. Think about the movie Superman. Where do you think Hollywood get all these, uh, these thoughts from? He was bound in ice all those years. And so Satan was bound in ice. And then, of course, uh, he had to be loosed upon the earth when God separated the water from the land. We see he's going to be bound again in the lake of fire, in the lake of fire. And uh, before he's cast into that, the Bible says he's bound, but then loose for another thousand years. And so the interesting thing, of course, is this whole creation and this thought about this amazing gap between verse one and verse two. It could have been thousands, even billions of years. I don't know. But enough to say, I don't believe God creates anything dark and without void. And we see the recreation of earth, the recreation of this planet, this beautiful planet that stands in the universe. The Spirit of God is moving across the earth as, as it was then, as He is today. And so in verse 3, God said, you know, 10 times in the book of Genesis, it said, God said, 10 times, God said, God said, God said, God said, 10 times, God was very involved in the creating of what we have today. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For it was God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we see the Bible first in the natural, then in the spiritual. You know, the New Testament relates everything back. We see this by Jesus fulfilling 
the first Adam. We see this in many ways of the tabernacle and of the feast. And we see this right throughout Scripture. And here in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul's writing and he talks about creation. God commanded light to shine out of darkness. But who has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So we were living in darkness. But Jesus comes along and he said, I'm the light of the world. And so when we invite Jesus into our heart, we too become the light of the world. And so God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. God is a fountain and the source of all life. And in verse 4, it says, God saw that it was good. Do you know seven times? Seven is a, a beautiful number, the number of completion. It says, God saw it was good. God saw it was good. It was beautiful. And, uh, you know, there was only one day when he didn't say it was good, the day that the, the earth and the water were separated. Maybe that was the day that, that Adam got loosed and God didn't like that. But enough to say that God saw it was good. It was beautiful. And then in verse 5, God called. Five times it says God called. What I'm saying is the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, God called was a central figure. He was so involved. Nothing came into being without him. You know, there are no mistakes in God. And can I just say this? There are also no missing links. The reason in evolution, they call it the missing link, is because it's missing. It's not there. Do you know there are millions of fossils with backbones and millions without backbones, but there's none in between. Don't be fooled now. The Bible says in verse 11, verse 21, and verse 24, every plant, every animal, fish and birds, they were all created and set in motion to reproduce after their own kind. You know, obviously, sometimes people adapt to certain situations, certain, certain circumstances, and that's true even in the animal kingdom. But we don't see, you know, monkeys coming out of the trees now becoming man. You have man and you have monkeys. Bible says, well, we got some DNA. Do you know the DNA is a building block of the universe? Everything's got DNA. We got the DNA of a banana in us. And just like concrete is a building block to cities, the DNA is a building block to creation. And so we've all got a similar DNA running through us, but human beings are unique. Not only that, every animal is unique. Every bird and every fish. You know, you don't see fish coming out of the, earth, out of the sea today, becoming uh, man, uh, land, uh, living animals. And likewise, you know, we could talk about evolution, the folly of man, Charles Darwin. You know, he's an outdated fossil. He had a theory way back in the 18th centuries. And of course, to be honest, we've outgrown that. We know today that that is not to be true. But yet we still teach it in schools because we don't want to acknowledge God is a creator of heaven and earth. There's only two possibilities. We came by chance, but let's be honest. What chance is there that we came by chance? No chance. And so the only alternative is that God created the heavens and the earth. And so we have over 2 million different species of plant and animal life each one creating, each one producing after their own kind. We have over a million different species of insect. And in verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. And so it's man who's a unique creation of God. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, in verse 27, says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. male and female, he created them. You know, mankind is the only species, if you like, that worships. And every race, every ethnic group worships. Within man, there is such a thing as eternity. You know, a dog doesn't look up and think, hey, I wonder where I'm going when I die. You know, man does. Every person thinks about that. Where did I come from? Where am I going to? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I need to read John 1 verse 1 because that New Testament book has a similar beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We're talking about Jesus. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. I get excited about this. 
In him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend him. Remember what I said before about how God shines in our heart through Jesus. He came to his own, to the Israel, the people of Israel, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him, but as many as received them, because they were looking, they were looking for a king to deliver them from uh, the oppression of the Romans. And of course, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming back as a king. But they missed him being the suffering servant, the one who gave his life, the lamb that opened not his mouth. And the prophets of old spoke and prophesied not only about the lion, the king that's reigning, but also about the lamb. And the Israelites missed the mountain, uh, the valley in between the 2,000 years. You know, when you look down the corridor of time, all they saw was these two events as one the lion and the lamb, the king and the servant. But the thing was, there's 2,000 years separating them. He came first as a serpent, uh, sorry, uh, a servant, as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion, as a king. And it says, To them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were, not, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. Talking about Jesus now, the Word, remember in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. We behold His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, <laughs> full of grace and truth. I need to read Colossians 1 verse 15 before we really get into Genesis and Revelation. Colossians 1 verse 15. Here's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. See, how important is Jesus? Everything. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have preeminence. Wow. I mean, you could chew on that just for a week. Friend, make no mistake about it. Jesus was more than just a carpenter from Nazareth. He was more than just a, a good man. A lot of people, of course, to be honest, you'd have to be an absolute fool to say that Jesus did not exist. That's not the question. Of course, he existed, just like Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. There's more evidence that Jesus existed than all those people put together. He's the most documented person in history. But the thing was, the question is who he was. Was he a madman? Was he a liar? Or was he who he claimed to be? Because he had to be one of those three. Because, you know, let's be honest now. If he wasn't just a good man because he said, I am the son of God. A good man doesn't tell lies, right? And so I believe he was who he said he was. He wasn't a madman. A madman can't walk on water and heal the leper and cast out demons and raise the dead. He did all those things. And so it pays us to believe he was who he said he was. He is the only one who ever came back from the dead. That's why he stands out in the history of time. That's why he stands out above everybody else. In three and a half years, he turned the world upside down. That's why our date, our year today, is dated after Jesus Christ. He is a central figure in the history of man. And so he's more than a statue up the front of a church. He's more than just a Christmas uh, picture on a postcard. He's more than just a nice story. He is a son of God. He is God in the flesh. He's a creator of all things. You know, the creator of the earth. When I think about in the beginning, God created the earth. I want you to think about this. Before we get into Genesis and Revelation, I'm just excited to share it all. But you know, the earth, our planet, 6,000 trillion ton, tons hanging in space, hanging in space by itself, is surface revolving at a rate at 1,100 miles an hour. You don't feel like you're moving, but not only are we revolving at 1,100 miles an hour, the whole earth, listen now, the whole earth planet is moving through space around the sun at 18 and a half miles per second. We're not only revolving and we're moving, we're making a circuit in one year of almost 600 million miles. Now we take that for granted, but you know the book of Job, one of the oldest books of the Bible, Job, written thousands of years ago, before science discovered it, before man took a picture of the earth hanging in space. The book of Job says that the earth is a globe. It says that it's round, the circle of the earth. You know, man might have said the world's flat. The Bible never did. 
But the Bible also says, the book of Job says that it's hung in space and that it is revolving. Wow, way before science discovered it. You know, when God was dealing with Job, God asked Job, can you guide the star Arctarchus with his sons? He says in verse 32, can you lead forth the constellation in its season? Can you guide the bear with her satellites? You know, he says, God says, do you know the ordinances of heaven or fix their rule over the earth? Because God names the number of stars. He numbers the names of stars and he names them in the heavens. You know, this star that God points out to Job, can you guide this through the heavens? You know, God, this star, this one particular star, it was claimed by early astronomers to be a stationary star. And so they said God had it wrong. The Bible's wrong. This star is stationary. And God singled out this one star to challenge Job. Can you guide this star? Astronomers have now calculated that this is one of the fastest moving stars in the universe. It moves at stupendous speeds. And so Job is a book that tells us that God even seals up the hand of every man. The book of Job, thousands of years before Scotland Yard discovered that every man has got a fingerprint. Every man is different. Eight billion of us are different. And the book of Job says God seals up the hand, puts a seal on the hand of every man. Oh, this book, this Bible is a wonderful book.